I'd like to continue a bit from last week, if I may, and um, for those who weren't here, the, the talk last week, which went for most of the whole hour, was um, an exploration of spirituality and sexuality. Um, here we come to this sitting group or to retreats or wherever you've learned practice, and we learn to sit. And a, a big part of the practice of sitting, besides filling the physical body, is the cultivation of mindfulness or awareness. Learning to be more aware of our bodies, of our feelings, of our hearts, of our relationships, of our thoughts and intentions and to discover some capacity for wisdom that we can nourish in ourselves or some greater capacity for love and compassion. And in beginning to speak about sexuality, we're really asked to treat it as another part of practice, equally much as the breath. And uh, as you've probably noticed, there are times when the breath is boring and there are times when it's very interesting, and there's times when it's in the middle. And even sexuality has cycles like that. There are times when it's fabulously interesting, and there are times when it's dull, comparatively, perhaps, anyway. It has its own, it has its own cycles. What we're asked to do is to begin to look first at our conditioning. What is our conditioning in relationship to being in a physical body? or to having a vagina and breasts, or a penis, or a womb, you know, what, what, what's our, how do we relate to that? I mean, we got it. Um, do we like it? Do we hate it? Is it embarrassing? Is it, um, what, what's our relationship? Is it fearful? Is it delightful? And then to our relationship to the activities that come out of being a sexual being to being a, an animal, a biological entity. And how, how do we act then? What's our relationship to the actions that are based on this, this reality? And as I ended last week, I gave a suggestion for people during this week, which was to begin to observe their sexuality, whether they were actively sexual or not, whether you're actively sexual or not, just to begin to look at what states or what experiences arise together with your sexual energy or your sexual impulse or sexual imagery. Because sexuality, as I said last week, in some ways can be seen as a neutral energy. And in times associated with greed or compulsion or fear or aggression or uh, addiction, at other times, it can, that same energy can be associated with tenderness or communication or love or compassion or intimacy. And just to begin to observe what are the states of the mind and the heart that arise in relationship with, to it. There's a very important Buddhist teaching that this connects to, which is the teaching of the law of karma or in Sanskrit, it's karma vipaka. Two words, which means basically cause and result. Karma actually just means cause. It doesn't talk about the result. In our slang parlance, we've kind of put them together. But um, some saint or other in India, I remember, said that the foolish person looks at results and the wise person looks at causes. So to look at karma in terms of causes is actually very helpful. Another word for karma, and an important one if one wants to understand just this laws of how it operates in our life, is that karma is synonymous with intention. That the kind of karma that is made in our lives is the result not so much of the actions or words that we do, but of the intention, of the state of mind and the heart that motivates them. So that you can do, you can use something, you can use a knife to kill a person, or you can use it as a scalpel to save their life as a surgeon. 
at times. You can do an action many different ways. It's not so much the action, but what is the state of the heart that motivates it. So if one wants to understand karma, or one wants to understand virtue or ethics or morality, which is something equally important and profound in developing a spiritual life, the, the way to do it is very simple. It's begin, beginning to know and observe and feel and understand what's going on in our hearts as we act. And as much as our actions come from the goodness of our heart, to that extent do we make good karma. And the world and our own lives and all of the potential happiness and goodness that can come, come as a result of those actions. Is that clear? That's really pretty simple, although not easy. But what's critical more than the actions is the, is the place in the heart. It's also tricky, you know, because you can say, well, I'm doing this because I really love this person. Um, I remember someone asking the Dalai Lama about mercy killing for animals, like shooting horses and so forth. And the Dalai Lama's response to that, saying, you know, was that a good thing to do? And he said, if it was your child, would you shoot it? If it had a broken leg or this or that. And he didn't mean to make a, a complete analogy, because in ethics you can't. Each situation is unique. But he just got that person to look again and say, well, wait a second. What is my motivation? Is it too hard and too expensive and too difficult to take care of the horse? Maybe that's really part of it. Um, part of it may be the suffering of the animal, so forth. But it's tricky. It's not a simple thing. Sexually, the same. Well, I'll do this because it'll make me happy and this other person happy, and that other one won't mind so much, or something like that. You got <laughs> You really got to listen to the subtle voices in there. And what is it based on? Is it based on greed or desire? Or what is the motivation? Now, it's interesting, in the West, uh, as I've said in some previous evenings, our place of learning about Dharma, for some strange reason, where, where it becomes very clear in many people's lives, is relationship. In, in third world countries, it seems to be more about food and survival because of the poverty and the, the immediate need for taking care of oneself or one's children or one's family. But in our much more prosperous circumstances, our sadhana, our practice, and, and a real touchstone to the principles of dharma for many people comes through our relationships. That's the place where we suffer, where we find rejection, fear, loneliness, loss, um, tremendous pain, tremendous grasping and desire for many people more than anywhere else, especially in the last few decades, which have been such an upheaval, really, of uh, Western and American sexuality and relationships. And when m most people think if they haven't had a really close person to them die in difficult circumstances or those kind of things, which are tremendously great teachers, but if you think about the more ordinary aspects of life that teach one about attachment or non-attachment or fear or openness of the heart or closing, where do you learn a lot? Relationships tend to be right up the top of the list. I was on a panel last year on spirituality and sexuality that I spoke of uh, here uh, at that time with Allen Ginsberg and Soltrim Alioni who wrote the book Women of Wisdom. Um, who came with her young Italian lover, or whoever he was. She was just ending a marriage. And Louisa Tisch, who is a priestess in, the, I believe, the Yoruba tradition, and cons expressed her, her practice in part. She saw herself as a divine harlot and as someone who was kind of inspiring people to understand pleasure. She was a, she was a great lady, and they were, all, they were all very interesting and wonderful in their own way. But what happened during the, the talking was that the three of them particularly were involved in sexuality for the sake of pleasure primarily, and at times for eros and, and the delight of it and 
to some extent, casual sex was talked about a lot. Um, it was a little bit more like sex on TV in some odd way. Um, and it didn't touch the, the kind of depths of it. This is from Kabir. Friend, wake up. Why do you go on sleeping? The night is over. Do you want to lose the day in the same way? Other women who managed to get up early have already found a jewel or an elephant. So much was lost already while you slept, and that was so unnecessary. The one who loves you understood, but you did not. You forgot to make a place in your bed next to you. Instead, you spent your life playing. In your twenties, you didn't grow very much because you didn't know what the truth was. Wake up! There's no one in your bed. He left you during the long night. Kabir says, the only woman awake is the woman who has heard the flute. Such a wonderful poet. And so part of the panel was about easy come, easy go, or the beauties of kind of erotic relationship. And then there was an amazing moment where a woman came up from the audience, the first person, and when the questions were allowed, who's actually a, a good friend of mine and a teacher of Vipassana as well, but she's just learning to teach, and she was really nervous, and she was shaking, and she stood up there, and she said, I heard about um, the, the beauties of sexual contact from Alan, and he read some of his kind of erotic... Um, poetry from young boys that he'd met and had relationships with. And I've heard about the divine harlot. She said, but I've been struggling so hard for a lot of years just to make one relationship work. Won't somebody please talk about that? And the room just stopped dead. And it was a, it was a very compelling moment. How can we learn from our sexuality and from our relationships? It's like the story I tell of Gurdjieff having that old, obnoxious man in the community that everyone was trying to get rid of. And he said, no, I pay him to stay here because only in relation to him being messy and irritable and angry and so forth are you going to learn about patience or kindness or love or commitment. Without him, you wouldn't understand that really. It's true in relationship. Absolutely true. And some people think that non-attachment, well, I'm not attached, and so forth. That means, well, one partner now, another partner a little later, easy come, easy go again. Um, doesn't work very good, I think most of us have found out. You do it, and then you end because of some problem or other, and then what happens in your next relationship? There's the same problem. Or it's opposite, because they tend to come in kind of pairs and you get to play the other side for a while, which is, it turns out, not much more fun than the other side. <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? There's a big difference between non-attachment and commitment. Non-attachment where it's, or attachment and commitment, rather, where it's, where it's misused. To enter into a relationship is the same as entering to a relationship of spiritual practice, which is to say that we sit, and if it gets a little uncomfortable, we get up each time it's uncomfortable, what happens? You never learn to meditate. Every time you're a little restless or bored, you get up. How deep does your practice get? And if it gets a little difficult with your partner, and you say, well, I'll find somebody better, you never learn to love. It's that simple. Not in some deep way. There's a really big difference. It's a poem, I don't even know whether to read it, from Pablo Neruda. It's called Girls. He's, he writes some great... This is from the Captain's Verses, which are some of his love poems. You who are seeking the great love, the great and terrible love, what happened, girls? Hmm? Because now here it is. See how it passes, dragging the heavenly stones, destroying the flowers and leaves with a noise of foam lashed against all the stones of your world, the smell of jasmine next to the bleeding moon. And now you touch the water with your little feet and with your little heart, you do not know what to do. Better are certain night journeys, certain compartments, 
certain most amusing walks, certain dances with no great consequence than to continue this journey. Die of fear or of cold or of doubt. For I with my huge steps will find her within you or far from you and she will find me. She who will not tremble in the face of love, who will be fused with me in life and death. He somehow takes it more seriously than that. So let's talk about relationships a little bit. To love is to die in a way, to let go of our ideas and ideals and opinions and all of that. There's a lot of surrender in making a relationship work. I remember when I first came back from the monastery and from the first period in Asia of five and a half or six years, and after a couple of months I got into a relationship with a woman who's still a good friend, and I'd been celibate for a number of years, but I was still quite young. I guess I was 26 or something like that. And we went off to this house in the woods to go to bed together, among other things, and listening to all this new music that I'd missed while I was away, and having a wonderful time. We got in bed and made love, started to anyway, and then I just started to shake all over, really vibrate, and very intensely. Wilhelm Reich would have liked it, I think. <laughs> and then I got really cold, and I stopped, and she said, um, what's, what's going on with you? <laughs> And I said, um, I feel like I'm dying. And my body got very cold, and it was shaking going through all this. And she was really concerned, because it was quite dramatic. And she said, well, what should we do? And I said, oh, nothing. You just watch it. I mean, this is sort of my monastic training. You know? And so I'm lying there, kind of noting dying, dying. And it was actually. <laughs> You can die of pleasure as well as pain. Um, It was a very powerful time. We actually ended up spending three days more or less in bed. I was kind of making up for lost time, and it was wonderful. (laughs) But the, the intensity that comes, even for people who've sat a meditation retreat or get quiet or go off in the mountains, where we let ourselves really open, the, the sexual experience as much as anything else can be a profound kind of dying, a profound kind of surrender. But all of relationship is surrender. If you want it to work, you have to be willing to give somewhere around oh, 70 to 90 percent, say 85 percent. If you give 85 percent and get 15 percent back, then it'll work. It won't work 50-50. You know why? Because when you give 85% and get 15% back, the other person feels like they're giving 85% (laughs) and getting 15% back. That's usually how it happens. It's true. It's true. It's much more, it's easy to experience how much you're giving, and it's, it's a little harder often to realize how much you're receiving. So that's another thing that makes it work. Besides sensing, Commitment, and commitment doesn't mean that we'll be together in the same way at all. It means that we're together with an agreement to help each other grow. Because if you, if you fix the other person, it will die very shortly. Since we're alive and we change and we have seasons like trees that have blossoms and they lose their leaves and they get more leaves and they have fruit, people do the same thing. We're, we're animals, we're physical. And so it's more to honor the life cycle of the other animal as well as your own. To nourish, to foster, to assist. What also helps make them work is the profound quality of acceptance. What I found in my own marriage and the long relationships I've been in is I get to these moments of frustration or difficulty and so forth. And then the basic thing that comes to mind is I have to accept, or it's actually a question, do I have to accept that too? And there's always just one answer. Uh Yep, Uh mm mm-hmm, that too. You know, you mean I've got to accept that about that person? I mean, I can't even accept that about myself. (laughs) 
and it's interesting because especially early on in my marriage, um, not so much anymore, but when those moments would come when I'd say, my God, I'm not sure, you know, as the glow wears off of the beginning of relationships and you really look at that other person and they're not who you thought they were, you know how that happens. Um, and I'm saying, well, I'm, can I accept this person the way they are, that part too? And then what I would do is I'd put in mind all the other great women that I knew. Just, you know, kind of think, well, maybe I should leave them. And I think about all these other alternatives. And what was interesting, because I really let myself do it and follow it through, each of those women that I thought of didn't have that particular problem. But they had some other problem. <laughs> Uh -huh. I thought, God, if I'm with her, then I'll have to deal with this, you know, or if I'm with that person who I really like and is wonderful in these ways, then I'd have to deal with their thing about that or this aspect. And there wasn't anybody that I could think of that really was perfect for me. <laughs> it was a drag and it was very relieving. <laughs> it was like that story I told of Nasruddin, I guess I started with last week, where he's looking for the perfect wife. And finally, after all these women, he finally finds her and says, someone says, well, did you marry her? And he said, no, I'm s just never worked out. She was looking for the perfect husband, which he certainly isn't. So it's to understand not only that you have to give 85%, but also that you have to accept that too, whatever that is, for the most part, for it to work. It's an amazing place to learn dharma, to learn about attachment and suffering. The extent to which you suffer is the extent to which you are attached. Or to learn about how desire makes pain. Little desires make little pains. Desire itself is tension, is painful. And I don't mean the desire of eros. You can play with that. But I mean the desire of grasping. And our desire really is what keeps us from living in the moment. What we want, what we hope for, keeps us from seeing, from experiencing, from touching, from loving. Because there's only one place you can love. I've said this many times. We can't love in the past because it's a memory. We can't love in the future because it's a fantasy. The only place we can love is the present moment. And so it's be it becomes interesting to look at what aspects of ourselves keep us from being with what's actually here rather than what we wish or hope. <coughs> Relationships are places that show us about addiction, about loneliness, about the things that haven't been healed in our past because that's where a lot of our addiction and loneliness and all of that comes from, is past things that aren't healed. And then we bring that and hope this other person will replace something that wasn't really fulfilled for us. And they can to some extent, but to the extent that we don't heal ourselves, to that extent does there come something false, some grasping after that person for what they're not. It's not terribly esoteric. And it's a very immediate, direct way of learning about Dharma. There's a story about Nasruddin again, one time. He was wandering around India, and he met this great yogi. And this yogi said, oh, I see that you are wearing the turban of a mullah or a wise man. Won't you join me? And Nasruddin sat down with him, and, he, and the yogi explained his philosophy. He said that I'm, I'm someone who just loves the earth and I love the plants and the animals. I would never harm. And I, 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 my whole practice is my connection with the, with the <coughs> birds and the beasts, kind of like St. Francis, this yogi was. And Nasruddin said, I, I have a great um, fondness for them myself. He said, I, I mean, I had an experience once where a fish saved my life. And this yogi was very taken by this. He said, even after all my years of communing with the birds and stuff, I've never been so intimate with, a, with an animal as to have a fish, something like a fish save my life. Master, won't you please tell me? And he bowed down to him and touched his feet and to please explain and talked more and more about how much he loved animals. And Nasruddin said, I'm not sure that you would appreciate the relationship that I had. The yogi kept insisting. He said, well... 
I was lost in the mountains for many, many days, and I caught this fish finally, and I was so hungry, and he provided food for me for a whole week, and I got out of the mountains, and I was safe, and I thanked that fish for saving my life. It's not some esoteric teachings of what are the yogis in India doing or what is the uh, tantric teachings to be found for us or what is there in Buddhism or Hinduism or something ancient or, or elsewhere. Um, it's, it's as immediate as eating. It's as immediate as our own physical bodies. The basic principles of attachment and suffering, of opening, of generosity. And we can see relationships as a kind of a school, as a place where we can learn, like Gurdjieff's old man, to live a little more gracefully or a little more wisely. Or as a place to learn to open our hearts a bit more to explore with interest, to get the seven factors of enlightenment, joy and interest and investigation and equanimity, to find the factors of enlightenment in relation to another person, in relation to sexuality. Not to demand so much, but to use it as a place to explore, to grow. Then it becomes more exciting. And of course it's difficult periodically. It's probably the hardest thing we do. That's okay. It's a place where you find all the foundations of mindfulness, body, feelings in the heart, mind, and the laws or the spirit of things, the erotic, the romantic, the the physical, the feeling, the, the mental ideals and images, and the spiritual, all of those are found in our relationships. Now, it's interesting when you look at them as a practice to realize that the same hindrances arise in your intimate relationship that arise when you sit on your cushion. Remember the five hindrances? We've talked about them other times. Desire, anger, restlessness, sleepiness, or laziness, and doubt. Desire comes up in relationship. Desire for another person. Desire for something to be different. Aversion and anger and irritation, that never comes, mind you, of course, the second one. Then you get through those. Then there's... um, laziness, not putting enough energy into it. And then there's restlessness. That's the other side. You get cycles of restlessness. Then you get doubt. Has anybody not experienced those in their relationship? Raise your hand. (laughs) They're, They're as much a part of it as when you sit with your own breath and body. So how does one work with them? You begin to work with them in the same way, first by identifying them, seeing them, beginning to see the patterns, and maybe not taking them quite so seriously. Allowing them, but not struggling or getting quite so caught up in them, bringing the quality of mindfulness to them. The principles of attachment and suffering, the principles of opening and surrender, of relating wisely to the body, the heart, the spirit, the principles of working with the hindrances, looking at the the beautiful difference between separation and unity, which we express both of, or zero and one. Sometimes we need to be separate. Sometimes we need to merge. Actually, they happen one moment after another all the time. We're letting more things in, and then we're defining ourselves with our thoughts and our images. And it's to get a sense of this dance of what it means to let go and merge, and at the same time, to respect our individuality. Becoming aware of pleasure and pain in relationship and our fear of both. Some of us fear pleasure, whereas we're more afraid of pleasure than we are of pain. Is that so for you? Look at it and see. Others of us fear pain. Some of us are afraid of both, just afraid of opening in any way. All the different principles of the Dharma. Looking at what keeps us closed, which very often is things that we don't say. And I don't mean to keep, uh, to, to say that you need to express everything. That would be a tragedy in a relationship. And you'd be up all night every night anyway. <laughs> you, some of us have tried that in the old days, right? There's a balance, just like merging and separation. There's a balance between saying what needs to be said. That which keeps your heart closed is what needs to be said, which will allow it to open. And not kind of 
um, emotional pollution, as someone said, not necessarily saying everything that comes through. Learning about that, learning what keeps us closed, what allows us to open. All of the parts of the Dharma, healing is there. A relationship can be used to heal, to heal the things from our past, to heal our loneliness, to heal things. Uh, it doesn't mean that that person will do it for you. I, I've been with my wife and been as lonely as any other time, you know, and it's really shocking here. Went through all this trouble to live with somebody, to kind of not be lonely, and there you are, and the two of you are feeling lonely. It's not uncommon. So it's work we have to do inwardly. But that's the kind of healing that can take place. Stephen Levine does a very beautiful meditation in the week-long retreats that he teaches, which is for women, but it could be done by men in a different way, which is called sweeping the womb with light. You bring your attention as a woman into your womb and your ovaries and the fallopian tubes and the vagina and all of the genitals. And first try just to feel it, and then gradually to move through it with loving kindness and light and feel all of the places that have caused it to close, all of the rejection or all of the fear or all of the painful conditioning or, or for many people worse things than that, kinds of sexual abuse and so forth. And to begin to touch those areas with kindness and love and attention to allow that to open like a letting the heart open. And that's the equivalent. There's some biological and anatomical equivalent between the womb and the heart. They're the only two things in the body that have a certain kind of muscle tissue that's very similar. If you want to do it as a man, you can do it with your sexuality through the genitals or through your heart as well. Anyone can sweep your heart and begin to see what are the barriers and what things have made it close. And how is it possible to find that level of tenderness or of forgiveness that can touch it and allow it to open again? So there's a lot of healing. There's the whole, pr which is one aspect of spiritual practice. There's the whole practice of the refinement of virtue, of right speech and right action in, in sexuality and relationships, which means, again, listening to the heart, letting our actions come from a conscious heart and bringing an awareness to our intentions so that they really speak from our deepest wisdom, our, our greatest strength of compassion. There's dana, there's sila, there's bhavana, which means inner cultivation, meditation. Where, what better place to find equanimity than relationships? What place needs it more, even more than sitting in yourself? This is the time of tension between dying and birth, the place of solitude where the dreams cross between blue rocks. And when the voices shaken from the trees drift away, let the other yew tree be shaken and reply. Blessed sister, holy mother, spirit of the fountain, spirit of the garden, suffer us not to mock ourselves with falsehood. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still even among these rocks. And even among these rocks, sister, mother, spirit of the river, spirit of the sea, suffer us not to be separated. This is T.S. Eliot. Teach us to care and not to care. An amazing line. All the Dharma in that one poetical line. Teach us to love life and to respect one another with tenderness and yet to see its dance, to not have to grasp it. The cultivation of the qualities and the factors of enlightenment, all these things. And then even to the highest dharma, how can we relate our sexuality and our relationships to one another to the absolute and studying with Nisargadatta Maharaj in Bombay, the old beady salesman and so forth, he used to tell people, he would say, don't make a big deal of your spiritual practice. Go home and marry the boy next door or the girl next door or whatever it is, wherever, you know, and, and work in your, your family business or something like that. Live a normal life. You don't have to make some costume up for it, for this spiritual search. 
do that and just keep one thing in your mind and your heart. See if you can figure out who's doing it. That was his only question. See if you can discover what is the true nature of this being which goes through all of that. And then someone asked him, they said, I'm having trouble, I feel too selfish in my life, in my relationships. And he said, the trouble with you is not that you love too much, but that that you love your that you love yourself too much he said that's not the trouble but that you don't love yourself enough he said take it to its limit see if you can learn to love yourself so fully that you give yourself not just the little things but the absolute the timeless the completeness of all things that's what you seek he, he would say over and over again this is what your heart yearns for why not give yourself that Someone asked him, because he speaks a lot about the, the absolute in terms of the reality. He calls it the real or the absolute. He said, well, why in this divine leela, this divine dance, why does the real or the absolute go through this process of taking all these forms that we do? And he responded, what, what does it gain from this? He responded, what could it possibly gain? Nothing whatsoever. But somehow, it is in the nature of love to express itself, to affirm itself, to overcome difficulties. Once you've understood that the world is made of love, that its substance is love, that it's love in action, you will look at it all quite differently. But first, your attitude to suffering must change. Suffering is primarily a call for attention, which itself is the movement of love. More than happiness, love wants growth, opening, the widening and deepening of consciousness and being. That is your true nature. Whatever prevents that becomes a cause of pain, and love does not shirk from pain. It's an amazing thing to say that our being is love, that what we seek is really our own nature. That's enough of my words for this evening and others. Said a lot the last two weeks, sexuality and relationships. Please, comments or things that are that come to you as you listen or that you'd like to say or questions, anything. Experiences you want to relate, (laughs) sexual or otherwise. Relationships are wonderful. Relationships are wonderful. (laughs) Thank you, Constance. They are wonderful. They are wonderful. And what I saw in the in, interesting, even in the monastery, was that there were some very wonderful and profound and intimate kinds of relationships, though not sexual. Sometimes students to teachers that, that they really loved, or or monks to one another, or nuns to one another, that were that were exquisite. They're part of our life. They are wonderful and terrible. <laughs> Please. It's, it's interesting. It gets tricky sometimes. That, and that's beautiful and it's true. But sometimes it gets really good and the good has a, a quality of pleasure in it. And then our conditioning is, well, let's keep it this way. Let's keep us in love. Or sexually the same kind of it, attachment happens. You have, why couldn't you get so easily enlightened? Um, 
in, in the sexual act itself, because there is this one-pointedness and concentration and energy and certainly interest, you know, all of those factors of enlightenment. But very often it gets mixed as well with a great sense of grasping and just the thing that you say. And so we can almost learn through attention and through our heart and through caring to separate out those two and to allow for one and, and maybe to let go a little bit of that other, other part that holds it. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.